um, a few things going on in our uh, in our in our studies, our women's Bible study at two o'clock on Tuesday. That's happening. So um, women come out for that. Good time to review the sermon as well as just be together and have good fellowship and laughter, and joy there. I made a lot of fellowships continuing through the book of First Samuel, and um, we're having a good time together there. So that's at seven o'clock on Wednesdays. And then, really excited, oh, I'm sorry, let me back up there. This coming Wednesday is Ash Wednesday, yes. So we'll be here in the sanctuary and just a time of dedication and consecration of our lives. Lord, what would you have us do in this time that we call before, before the Holy Week, before Passion Week, uh, just in our own lives? Lord, clear out the junk in our lives and, and be consecrated to him. So that's what uh, Ash Wednesday is about. So right here, 7 o'clock on Wednesday night. And then Saturday morning is Walk Through the Bible. I sure hope that you've signed up, and we're going to have an outstanding time. It is a high-energy, participatory, kinetic type of exercise, learning the Old Testament in three hours and also just getting to know one another better. But God's great story. You'll really enjoy the guest speaker, the presentation, and you'll learn the story and the, and the truth, how it all points to Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. So if you've never even gone through the whole Old Testament, this is your time to do that, and then you'll be able to tell others. So that is at 9 o'clock. Be here right at 9 o'clock, because we really need to get started getting into this. Uh, 9 o'clock on Saturday morning. There'll be lunch provided, some snacks as well. So you won't want to miss that. And bring some friends. Bring some friends. Uh, it would be a great time together. Uh, it's only $10 if you register, and uh, if you need help with that, we'll help you to get the uh, $10 for um, for the, for the registration there. Uh, several things you can see on our prayer list there. We've had quite a week, mm, quite a week of prayer needs. And in just a moment, our friend uh, Bob Ross is going to come up and pray for the church locally and worldwide, getting in on Bob better. But uh, uh, yes, we pray for uh, peace in Ukraine and for courage of believers. Uh, a video I saw that just tore my heart out. I'm going to start you're not going to like it. I'm going to keep blubbering here. But uh, the, there's a group of, of young, uh, believers in a just closed-off room somewhere in Ukraine, and they were singing, He Will Hold Me Fast. Mm. But we see here many other needs, health-wise and otherwise. We're praying for Nancy Gareth and both her sons, Rob and Dale, as they recover in their health. They face some very, very serious uh, health-related uh, things, uh, Rob with COVID and Dale with a, with a tumor in his lung. Uh, pray for Brad and Holly Hines. So their daughter is going through respiratory illness, and uh, she's an opera singer, as you know, so she can't sing. She's missed some of those notes in her register, so it's really concerning for, for Linda. Uh, others that are listed here, you can see Vincent. We're praying for him and his health and recovery, uh, treatments, um, you can see uh, Vincent. Uh, the Schott family, not only SOS Ministries, of course we want SOS Ministry to glow and grow and flourish, but uh, we're also praying for Sandy and Mike and their daughter for medical issues that they're going through. Uh, you'll see others that are listed here, Doc Severinsen, Julie Wasson, the Gordon family as they go through grief and loss, and Gary and Donna Hoffmeyer um, praying, for, praying for that cancer treatment. It's been a really, really, really rough week for Gary in the hospital a couple of times, a couple of surgeries, uh, just chemo is tough. Yeah. Thanks for that update. I think I mentioned Catherine McKay as well. We prayed for her last week. So, you know, keep praying for all these things. These are just a lot going on in our church body. But uh, uh, God is greater. So, uh, Bob, if you would come forward and pray for us, please. Bob is a, a man of God. We're getting to know him more and more as he's uh, just out of a men's conference yesterday. And he spoke and gave a wonderful message uh, from Scripture and his heart. And uh, he's written many, many, many books, biblical counseling, marriage counseling books, and otherwise. So Bob's going to lead us in a time of prayer before we go into the Word. Let's pray. And uh, I'd like to 
begin our prayers with some words inspired by the Holy Spirit. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. Mm -hmm. Yes, Lord, you are great and most worthy of praise. And we come here today as one people. In the name of Christ, your Son, to tell you how thankful we are for your mercies to us, for giving us your Son to die for us, to adopt us into your family as one people, as brothers and sisters in Christ, and assured of your mercy and care for us throughout these days of trouble, hardship, sickness, distress, famine, or war, whatever we or others are going through. We thank you for the knowledge of your power, your greatness, that you are king over all the earth. And we pray for your will to be done, for you to accomplish your purposes, to bring righteousness and justice and peace and healing to this troubled world. We pray for members of our own family, our own immediate families, our church family, those who are listed in this bulletin today who are suffering a multiple health problems. We know that Jesus is the great physician and his power to heal is still effective. And we reach out and beseech you be merciful to these who are suffering, to bring health and healing and comfort to them in the days of their distress. We pray that you will bless our pastor as he opens the word to us, that you will open our hearts, that you will help us to, to comprehend, to understand your goodness, to depend upon your goodness, to lean upon you, and to trust your word and to become obedient to you that we may enjoy all the blessings that you have for us as we walk in the light of your presence and in obedience to your will. Now, finally, we ask you to hear our prayer as we close in the words of our Lord himself who taught us to pray, saying, Our, our Father, Father, who art, art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come. Thy, thy will, will be done. done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bob. One other uh, brief announcement, just an update. Uh, Tina and Sabir and the baby are doing well. They're not quite ready to come back yet. Uh, you know how, how babies are. But uh, uh, their prayer, your prayers are appreciated for them as they, uh, uh, as they have a new child to parents. So wonderful, for a wonderful blessing there. Okay, well, we're going to get right into the Word because I feel, I feel full already. Uh, the women singing, the, the wonderful sisters, the wonderful prayers, uh, music, all that. So I feel, feel blessed. So we're going to jump right into this. God, Lord, would you speak? Oh, Lord, um, your love and praise and honor above all things. We adore you. Speak to us, would you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I was the president, believe it or not, of my church youth group. Now, don't get too excited about that. It certainly didn't go into my head because there's only about 8 to 10 high school kids. But one of the responsibilities of being the youth group president in my church growing up in high school 
was that on Sunday nights when we would gather together, it was up to me to either deliver a message or to put together a skit or a drama, something that would be related to the Bible and help the kids grow in their relationship with Christ. Well, this one night I came up with the idea of going through the theme of what would it be like if, imagine this, a crime, it was a crime to be a Christian. Would there be enough evidence to convict you? And so I played a one-man role here of the judge, the jury, and the defendant. And I did all kinds of things in my high school mind to think that this would definitely be enough. I, I held up a Bible that I owned, a, a keychain that I owned, a cross in my pocket, things like that. The clincher, of course, is that I had placed, or at least I had access to a bumper sticker that talked about the Lord. Now, the judge and the jury, according to the play, found me guilty of being a Christian. But the more important thing is they said, well, you know what, you can come in, but your car, definitely, we want your car to come in to heaven. So that was kind of the clincher of the whole thing. And you've probably seen these things like that, that someone's car bumper is holier than they are. Well, it's uh, not something, you know, it's a lesson that I tried to learn a long time ago and still have to put into practice. It's not about how much you own, but how much of Christ owns you. That's the key lesson. It's not about how much you own. It's how much Christ owns you. Because he's everything. He owns all things. And we look into a passage of Scripture today, a difficult passage of Scripture, and I think we will be blessed, as we were encouraged to earlier, to look at this and say in our time of worship, in our time of, of just day-to-day -day living, how do we deal with the difficulties, even the persecutions that come at the hands of others because we follow Jesus? That's been the theme throughout the book of 1 Peter. And admittedly, it is a tough one to swallow. I really commend you for hanging with us through, really, the last two or three months as we've gone through this passage of Scripture. Because we all have, in our hearts and minds, a desire to fit in. A desire to be accepted. A desire to be looked at and, and, and to be liked and be well-spoken of by others. But there's a cold, hard reality that... Being more like Jesus means that you will be treated like Jesus. That's not easy to, easy to understand, is it? The, the reality is being more like Jesus in, includes being treated like Jesus, including the shame, the abuse, the mocking, and the scorn. We, we don't want to forget about that. But you, believer, your number one job is not to be popular not to give in to peer pressure, not just to have everyone like you. You, you want to do as much as you possibly can not to offend others and be obnoxious. But your number one job as a believer is not to be popular, but to be faithful. Your number one job is to be faithful. And the favor and the grace and the blessing of God rains down upon those who live with that priority in their minds. My job in this life, as long as I have breath in my lungs and blood in my veins, my job is to be faithful to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who saved my soul by his grace each and every day. So if you would turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 4, as we just go verse by verse, section by section through, as you're very well acquainted with, and our goal, of course, in every time is to know the word, live the word, and spread the word. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 9. Coming near to the end of this great letter that the Holy Spirit inspired the Apostle Peter to write almost 2,000 years ago. It's a letter of hope. A letter of hope to a people who were oppressed, who were beat down, who were overtly harassed and abused because they followed Jesus. And we have to kind of remove ourselves from current 21, 21st century Christianity here in the United States and put ourselves into the time of the New Testament and the time that most believers have lived in. It happened all the time as they were going to work, as they're in, the, in their household, as they're walking down the street. They could have been accosted or at least insulted because of their faith in Christ. And Peter gives them hope through this letter Prevailing government authorities, the, the religious leaders basically had in their mind, let's wipe out these Christians. 
Let's get rid of these Christians and their God, Christ, and just be done with them or put them in a corner so they're not going to say anything. Good old-fashioned intimidation, good old-fashioned terrorism, that's going to get them to shut up. That's the way we're going to get them to stop talking about Jesus, and we'll be able to go on with the rest of our careers, our own agenda. But Peter here, in this passage of Scripture, as we've seen throughout the book of 1 uh, Peter, has some very valuable lessons for helping us, and helping them back then, and helping us today, to bolster and strengthen, confirm, and establish our faith, so that when those times hit, and it's a when, not an if, when those times hit, the sufferings and trials you'll count as blessings. You know why? Because it makes you more like Jesus. It confirms his love for you. It strengthens and establishes him. It brings you closer to being like him. Now, in this section, actually, I said 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, but it starts a little bit earlier in verse 11. There's a wonderful doxology of praise to the Lord, as you see there at the end of verse, uh, verse 11. Peter had been talking about the end of all things being at hand and being self-controlled and stable in our, in our prayer life. He talked about loving one earnestly for, for the love covers a multitude of sins. Being hospitable, not just opening up our, our houses, but opening up our hearts to others. And then using our gifts to the glory of God. And then at the very end of verse 11 of chapter 4, To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. This is a praise. And Peter is praising God because he's had to deal with some really difficult issues, but God is still in control even in the midst of our suffering. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And so he bridges a transition from all these things that he's talked about up to this point, and then in chapter 5, which will start next week, he talks about specific roles in the church and spiritual warfare. You're going to want to be here for the next couple of weeks, especially to learn about these things that are coming up in chapter 5. But now in this section, Peter is encouraging them, don't be surprised at life's trials. Don't be surprised. He says, in starting in verse 12, beloved. I love that word. Because when I see that word, I think of you beloved. There's just a loving, endearing, caring, affectionate way in which Peter addresses the people of his day within the churches that he worked with. I'm with you. I care for you. You're important to me. So much so that I would get out a piece of paper and I would get out my pen and get out my ink and I would write this down and wrap it all up and send it by courier from church to church to church to church. I want so much for you to be ready, to be prepared and not surprised when life throws you some trials. Don't be surprised about that. In fact, I'm not just going to kind of give it in that generic sense that life is going to throw you some trials. Satan is going to attack you. This world is going to attack you. He said, this is tough to swallow. Ooh, hard. But it's true. Verse 12, don't be surprised, beloved. Beloved, don't be surprised. And then it ends up with not a negative command, but it says in verse 13, rejoice. There's the negative part of it. Don't be surprised, but rejoice. That's the sentence construction that's here. Peter's conditioning them and shaping them so that their response in difficult times is rejoice. I know it doesn't feel good at the moment. It seems totally unnatural. It seems very strange when you're going through a difficult time to condition your mind to say, no, 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 no. I'm rejoicing. I'm praising. It's not like you're going to make a, a, a dance or sing out loud, but you, in the deep depth of your heart, you're going to be able to say, I praise you because this is going to make me more like Jesus. Beloved, as it says in verse 12, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share in Christ's sufferings 
that you may rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Don't be caught off guard, in other words. Don't be so confused or surprised or flummoxed that these things are happening. When trials whack at you, how many ever played this game, whack-a-mole? You know, it starts out easy in one sense. You get one mole, you whack him, and he goes back down of his hole. And then the other one, bam, like this. But you know what happens pretty soon? It's kind of like our Christian life. There's two of the, oh, yeah. there's three. You know, you've got to keep whacking these things, and they just keep coming and coming and coming. I know that's kind of a, a fun way of looking at it. There's a lot more difficult way. Life isn't just a, a game of whack-a-mole. It seems like Satan and the world just keep shoving things up and shoving things up and in your face. How are you going to respond? Doesn't it say here, do not be surprised, but rejoice. Weird. Oh, wow, where did that come from? I can't believe that happened. Wow, this is really strange, you might say to yourself. No, in fact, Peter is saying this is normal. This is par for the course. Now, Peter could be looking at this in a couple different ways. In one sense, he could have been looking literally, historically, about the fiery trial that was coming upon the church. You see, at the time that Peter was writing this, at the time of the early church, there was an emperor. His name was Nero. And Emperor Nero inadvertently, well, probably not inadvertently, but by neglect, launched, uh, uh, basically burned half of Rome. It was a very shoddy construction and uh, very negligence in his uh, administration of the city of Rome and now throughout the Roman Empire. And as it says, he, he fiddled while Rome burned. You may have heard that thing. He might have been playing a harp, whatever it is. But, but a liar, yeah. But the re, you know who he blamed for it? He didn't blame himself. He didn't take the blame for himself. Well, it's my fault, or it's my soldier's fault, or my administrator's fault. No, it's those Christians. It's those Christians that set fire to the city and are causing all kinds of havoc throughout the entire empire. So he was the first emperor that had a significant edict of persecution against Christians. And you know what that meant. Christians either were thrown to the wild animals, lions, tigers, bears, gladiators who had slipped their throats. They were even put on posts, nailed to a post, and then covered with wax and, and pitch and, and flammable stuff. And then at Nero's dinner party in his garden, as the night would come on, they would, launch, they would light those bodies of those Christians who literally became Roman candles. They're, the flames would consume them. And so it's possible that Peter is referring here to literal fiery trials that's coming upon them. I mean, could you imagine what it would be? <laughs> they put my wife on a pole and burn her because she believes in Jesus? Or my son, or my daughter, or my aunt, or my uncle? Emperors after Nero perfected different forms of persecution. And it was a reality, as is a reality in many parts of the world even today. So we, we kind of have to be able to step out of our comfort zone here in 21st century America and realize that that's a reality back then and even today. Here, Peter said earlier in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes even though tested by fire, may, result to, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Your faith is more valuable than gold. Your testimony for Jesus Christ is more valuable than any gold, silver, platinum, whatever it might be, that's more valuable to God than anything else. Now, for those who are engineers or had any experience in this, uh, there's a field of study, a field of science called metallurgy. And in metallurgy, you have three distinct points of testing. There is the test of stability, where 
the, the pressure is equally distributed on all the parts so that it produces within that metal stability. The second is the yield point, where the stresses of the material make it stronger. That's what we call tempering that metal. So it's stronger than the surrounding container. But then thirdly, there's the failure point. Anyone who's an engineer who can uh, correct me on this. It's when the stress and the strain breaks the capacity of the material to hold up. And it breaks. It shatters, whatever it might do. At that failure point, we're at the end of our resources. We're at the end of our self-dependence. We're at the end of ourselves, and it's exactly at that point where God steps in, in our weakness, in our brokenness, to make a difference in our lives. Will you trust me? When our lives are shattered in a million tiny pieces, and it doesn't seem like anything is coming together once again, God steps in and refines us and makes us stronger and makes us better than we were, not better in ourselves, but more glorifying to God, and we're able to trust him in these things. A wonderful passage of scripture. I hope you memorize this one. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man, and God is faithful. Look at this. How is he faithful? He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape so that you may be able to endure it. Do you see that? Not beyond what you are able. And I can say with confidence in this room and many outside this room, many other churches in St. Petersburg and Florida and all around the world. Whew, when I say that, I think of the believers. That, I want to start crying again. In Ukraine or other parts of the world where there's threats to their lives every single day. Every time they come to worship, they wonder if they're going to go out the same door they came in in the same condition. Hmm. We experienced that. We saw that in Nigeria. We were there for one Sunday, and we realized that, thanks by God's grace, we were able to leave that building. But those believers were there every Sunday under the threat of, uh, 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 of death, pain. But for us here today, we see this passage of Scripture. We see what Peter's getting at. And who's here at the point of their brokenness and their failure? Or at least one point in your life you are. Or maybe you're headed in that direction. Stress and pain and strain are so much. You're broken, you're failed. The faithful God will not let you fall. He will not let you be shattered into all those millions of tiny pieces. He has a plan. He has a purpose. And this testing will result in his glory because you will be made more like Christ. The pure offering that's meant to please him. So that's why it says back in our passage here in 1 Peter chapter 4, and we see in verse 13, why we must rejoice. It's not just a suggestion, is it? It's actually a command. But rejoice, not optional. Rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that, when, that you may also rejoice and be glad in his glory when it, he is revealed. You're becoming more like Christ. Drawing near, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious, bleeding side. And that's what God's saying. Come closer to the cross. Come closer to Christ. Don't pay attention or pay heed to those that basically say a false teaching that, oh, when you believe in Jesus, everything's just going to be great. It's going to be easy. Never going to encounter any troubles or difficulties. You're never going to have a problem. You're never going to have issues in your life. No, don't believe that. Put that away. Pay no heed to it. It's wrong. If you do, then you obviously haven't read what Peter wrote here in chapter 4 and 50, the whole book. If it weren't for the trials, though, we wouldn't be drawn closer to Christ. We would be self-sufficient. Why would we need him? I eh, don't need him. Verse 13 sounds a lot like Peter uh, paraphrasing Jesus' beatitude in Matthew chapter 5. Where as he says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute. Blessed, see that? Jesus said this. 
Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you. And all these other things. Come on, I got my eyes aren't, aren't as good as they thought they were. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. <sighs> Again, I'm sorry this isn't a nice fluffy message, but it's the reality. And maybe sooner than we think. And do you think Peter also didn't have some firsthand experience about suffering and trials? There's a great story in Acts chapter 4 where Peter and John are going into the temple in order to worship. And they see a man who is there uh, alongside that everyone saw him. He was there every day begging for just a little piece of bread or some coins or whatever it might be. And Peter and John say, silver and gold have I none? Remember that? But what I do have for you, I say in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And what happens? He gets up and walks. He's starting to run around the courtyard of the temple. And people are praising God. And Peter and John are are pretty amazed, too, that God did this through them. But you know what their reward was? They got thrown in jail. And they were on, their lives were on the line. The very next day, they would be standing before the Sanhedrin tried to de- trying to defend themselves. And most likely, they would be condemned and most likely put to death because that was their goal. That was the purpose. Get rid of these Christians. Get rid of this menace. Get rid of this virus that's amongst us. You know what Peter said after a wonderful testimony, a wonderful testimony about Christ, that there is no other name under heaven by which we must be said, by, by which we must be saved. Um, Peter said this. He said, now when they saw the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the, the people that were in power, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were uneducated common men and were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Wouldn't that be so awesome? That when they saw their lives, these were common fishermen, ordinary people. They didn't have high degrees and PhDs and everything. Nothing wrong with that per se. But common, educated men, they were astonished. And they recognized, hmm, hmm. These guys sound like Jesus. Jesus had rubbed off on their lives. Somehow, some way, they detected enough of Christ in them that they were threatened and they could not stand up to the wisdom of Peter and John, and they were released. So Peter had some firsthand experience with what it means to go through trials, to have your life on the line. He's basically saying, rejoice now, because that's good, but it's going to get you in practice. It's going to get you conditioned. It's going to get you ready to rejoice more when Christ returns. Verse 13 again, But rejoice in so far as you share in Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. You're going to be right there. When the glory of Christ, and he comes in all his glory, you'll understand. This won't be a difficult thing. When Jesus returns, all the persecutors, all the abusers, all the scoffers, all the mockers, Jesus will be exalted, the victor and the vindicator of his own, no matter how much you've suffered at the hands of others. So this isn't a strange thing that comes upon us. In fact, even verse 14, it says, if or when you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of Glory and of God rests upon you. You're blessed, like Jesus said. And that beatitude, you are blessed. The Spirit of God rests upon the persecuted, abides, hovers over, remains upon. And and for believers, then, and even now, it's an everyday occurrence. You might be insulted. You might be scorned. You may take verbal abuse or accosted or or insulted. Not unlike Jesus when he was on his road, what they call the Via Dolorosa. Do you remember that? Let me just read that story once again as we're reminded. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters 
And they gathered there the whole battalion before him, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him. (laughs) They took the reed and struck him on the head. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. That's an insult. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So the chief priests and the scribes and the elders mocked him, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who crucified him also reviled him in the same way. You want to be like Jesus? We have to take the whole picture. Are you willing to go that way? the way of the cross. Many years ago, it was in the 1950s and 60s in communist Romania, a pastor named Richard Wormbrand was accosted in his home at night, come into his house, take him, throw him into prison, beat him mercilessly day in and day out for eight years. If you want to have a, a book that's very sobering, grab that book tortured for Christ. There's Thorn Brand in his mugshot. You know what his crime was? He preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. That was his crime. And he was tortured mercilessly, countless beatings and whippings. But Wormbrand says in this book, there was a strange comforting presence of Christ even in that jail cell. Even as he was being tortured, Christ came upon him in a strange way that you can't quite grasp. We can't put our finger on it. But he is with you even in your trial and in your pain. So don't be ashamed to suffer for Christ. As it says here in verse 15, look with me here, back to First Peter chapter 4. And let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. This is an honest warning. In other words, don't, don't suffer as a common criminal. A felon. You know, if you do these type of things, you should face the consequences. So if you're thrown in prison because you've murdered or because you've stolen things or done very other evil deeds or meddling in others' business, don't say, hey, I'm suffering for Christ. No, you're suffering rightfully. You're there because you broke the law and you sinned against God. That's not what Peter's talking about. I don't think probably was the problem in his church, and I don't think it's the problem here in Bay Point. I don't think there's rampant temptations to to do evil things, break the law, commit sin, that kind of thing. But what he was clearly doing here was making a clear contrast between those who are legitimate criminals and those who are criminals because they follow Jesus. Remember, like that little play I did in high school youth group, if it were illegal to be a Christian, would you be convicted by the evidence that they brought before you? Demonstrates this clear contrast. Even says there in in verse 16, yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, and Christian used to be a derogatory term, a little Christ. But actually Peter is elevating it here to say it's one who suffers for Christ, God's man. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. He's admonishing the believers, say, even whatever you're going through, even if it's against the laws of the state, not to follow Jesus, still follow him, keep preaching the gospel, living the words of Jesus. Again, if it were a crime, if it were illegal, Imagine that thing, and that's the truth in some countries even today. In a Christian worldview, 
Would there be enough in your character, in your words, in your attributes to be convicted? Be not ashamed. In fact, rejoice to say, God has poured so much of God's spirit and changed my heart and my life that it is a blessing to be counted among the, the criminals for Christ. Criminals for Christ. The blessed crime. That's as best as it gets. And Peter, once again, the very next chapter, in Acts chapter 5, went through the same type of persecution for preaching the gospel. You can only imagine in that jail cell, this is Acts chapter 5, after they had the opportunity, they, were, they, were, they said, don't go and preach about Jesus anymore. But what does Peter and John do? The other apostles? They start preaching about Jesus. You can't tell us to stop preaching about Jesus, the, the God who saved us, the Lord who loves us. So chapter 5, Peter, once again, very familiar with trials and persecutions and difficulties. So he's writing from experience, not just kind of off the top of his head, inspired by God's spirit, using the experiences of his life, he's arrested again. You imagine in that jail cell, some of the guys are kind of around there going, hey, what are you in for? Well, you know, I stole some horses. Well, you know, I beat up some people. Well, you know, I, I murdered a few people here and there, and so they're going to put me in, you know, they're going to put me away for the rest of my life and kill me. What are you in for, man? Preaching about Jesus. Really? That's your crime? That's your time? You are a believer in Jesus Christ, and that's why you're here? But you know the story, and we can go through this at another time. The angel opens the door cell, and Peter and all the apostles go out, and they start preaching again. And everything breaks loose. How did they get out? How are they once again out preaching? And Peter says this, and he testifies before the Sanhedrin, because they're wanting just to have these guys shut up, stop teaching and preaching in the name of Jesus. And here we find the Sanhedrin basically giving once again uh, a powerful testimony to the power in their lives. Then they went out from the council, presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Worthy to suffer. No shame, only glory to God. Worthy to say, to, to live by the name. Well, wrapping this up in many ways, we're going to kind of go through the next section very quickly here. But I do want to touch on very briefly verse 17 and 18. For it is time for judgment to, to begin at the household of God, and it begins with us. What will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? It's a good reason to get our house right before these trials, before these sufferings really come on hard. It's a type of uh, verse that admonishes us to, to clean house and how much we need to clean house in our lives. There's a, a show on television called Hoarders. Maybe you've seen this. Where people accumulate stuff and stuff and stuff and stuff, and they never throw anything out. It becomes a health hazard. It becomes a nuisance. It becomes just a terrible thing where, you know, there's stuff piled up to the ceiling, and someone's got to clear it out, or it gets torn away, and then off, carted off to the junk. Anyone, anyone see this show? Seen that? And it's really kind of interesting in one sense. Um... Some recover from this illness and others do not. But I think the Holy Spirit, in the same way, wants to do the work of clearing out the junk in our lives. What does it say? It is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. Clear out the accumulated junk that's obstacles and hurdles to following Christ and being used of him as he desires you to do. Be brutally honest with yourself. Lord, search and know my heart and see what is within me. Any wicked way, Lord, take these out because even if the end is coming, even if trials are coming, because they are, I want to be ready. I want to be found in him. And other things that happen, it's according to this verse. Those who remain in disobedience, it's a sad, sad reality eternally. But no creature is hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and exposed to the, him, to the eyes of him with whom we must give an account. Don't go into hiding. Remember Adam? When he sinned, they, the couple sinned, they hid. God wants you to come close to him. 
even in these times, even like Wormbrand in that jail cell, or Peter and John, or whoever, draw near to him. Even if difficult times to come, you can rejoice and praise God. He has made me more like Jesus. And that's our number one goal. Thank you, Lord God, for a time that we shared together. Difficult things in the word of God that remind us that it's not by power, it's not by might, but by your spirit, says the Lord. Enliven us, strengthen us, Lord, no matter what would happen in our days and the days of this generation or the next, when sufferings come, Lord, we will be able to rejoice because in your great way and your sovereign purpose, Lord, you're making us more like the Savior who walked the streets of Jerusalem after that cross, hung on that cross, bled and died, his poor blood poured out for us, even as we'll celebrate at the table just in a moment. Entrusted to you, faithful, holy God. Thank you for my brothers and sisters, and thank you, Lord, for their attention to your word. Give us strength, whatever might face us, Lord. And you receive all the grace and praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. We go before the table, the Lord reminded again that when Jesus took on flesh, what we call the incarnation, his body was destined to be broken for us. He gave us bread to his disciples on the Passover meal. He said, this is my body, which is broken and given for you. Take, eat, and do this in remembrance of me. The very being of God took on flesh and dwelt among us and did all the things that we do in the flesh, in the sense of uh, walking, talking, all that. But he gave himself, and God gave him the, the Holy Son of God, sacrifice for our sins. Same way he took the cup after saying, this is my body which is given for you, this is my blood which is given for you. The cup of the new covenant, this is how we will relate to God from now on. And it took the bleeding of his own son, the death of his son, the crown of thorns, the the scars, the beatings, and eventually he died. But he rose again, and we celebrate today, and we think of what the great sacrifice of Christ did for our sins. Take, drink, and do this in remembrance of me. So in the way in which Christ came, imagine yourself coming down the roads of Jerusalem, streets of Jerusalem bearing that cross, coming now to receive from him the forgiveness that he, he offers. Come in a way of humble, for, a humble brokenness at that point where you're broken, that's where God meets us. May I come to the table of the Lord, all who are believers in Jesus Christ. Uh, you'll join me over here at the serving table. If you have a need, a prayer request, please let me know. I'm happy, be happy to pray with you. Uh, the offering box is here as well for you to uh, offer and love the Lord in that way, gifts to God. But this is the time between you and the Lord to come before the table of the Lord. So I ask that others, while we're receiving, I know it takes just a little bit of time, that we would pray for one another, we'd read scripture, maybe a song that's played on the piano is helpful to you. But use this time wisely before the Lord. You may come to the table of the Lord. Come and enjoy what God has provided for you. Celebrate and be glad. He's paid the price for our sin.
Thank you, Marnie. Everybody, let's keep praying. And let's be ready in our hearts. Let's stand and close our time together. But uh, I pray that uh, we'll be together again and we'll uh, share the fellowship, the sweetness. Wonderful to have the ladies staying here this morning. The prayers, all that wonderful time. Time in the Word. Uh, you know this song. It's called Trust and Obey. And that's simply what we're called to do. Just be faithful. Oh, yeah. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Thank you, Lord. You've just simply called us to be faithful to you, Lord, to trust you and obey you. Whatever comes down the road, we know that you are with us, and Lord, you are able. You will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we are, we are able, but with that temptation, Lord, you will give us the way of escape. You'll give us the strength, Lord. Thank you for my brothers in Christ, my brothers and sisters, Lord. Thank you for their faithfulness to you, Lord. And we love you. We praise you. May your peace reign in our hearts and our lives to the glory and the praise of the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Go in his grace. Join us for fellowship in Ross Hall as well. God bless you.